thank you, Florence. Um, today, we're talking about how cities can tackle uh, food insecurities in our different cities. Before I go into who is going to talk, I, I, I would like to give a, a bit of a background on food insecurity. According to the World Bank uh, group, uh, it seems more than acute uh, food insecurity oh, about oh, 193 so million people. The city provides Can everyone mute, please? Thank you. As I was talking about food insecurity, I'm saying uh, 193 million people reported to be facing acute uh, food insecurity. And that's 40 million more as compared to. Uh, we have speaker Bangladesh and the Niham who will be telling us how what they're doing, how they're doing it on uh, dealing with food insecurity. And our first speaker today, without further much ado, will be Dr. Kinashi. Kathy, we're having some yeah. connection issues, I'm afraid. Your, um, your, your, your connection's a little bit unstable. Just, oh, oh my god um, not to worry if you just um wouldn't mind just uh, reintroducing dr tinashe and just speaking quite slowly and clearly um but we, yeah we're having your connections breaking up on us unfortunately can you hear me now can you hear me for it we can hear you yeah it's just a little bit broken up Okay, so I'll try to speak as slow as possible so that you can hear me. Our first speaker is Dr. Tinashi from City of Johannesburg. He is the director of integrated planning and research in the city of Johannesburg. Dr. Tinashi is a strategist, an economist, and the public administrator working for the city of Johannesburg uh, in the policy review analysis, development and monitoring and evaluation in the support of city of the Hansberg social development vision. Prior to joining the city, Dr. Tinashe worked on both the University of Johannesburg and the University of Cape Town, advancing the growth of SMEs in townships, as well as promoting community development and grant making perspectively. He also served as the vice chair in the demographic our research division of UNISA as national committee member for South African Bureau of Standards. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Tinashi. Over to you. Thank you. And you have 10 minutes. Thank you very much, um, uh, Chair. Uh, am I audible? Can I proceed? Yes, you are. You can proceed. Yes, you are. Very well. Okay. Let me try to share my presentation. Hopefully you can see the presentation, Chair. Yeah, all good, we can yeah. see it clearly. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Wherever you are, I don't know if it's in the morning there or in the afternoon here, yeah, it's, it's still in the morning, uh, morning of, of our winter. Uh, it's, it's actually good that I join you today to discuss uh, the topic under consideration. And my approach today is to discuss the food systems shocks that uh, cities are likely to face towards 2030. And uh, we know that uh, we have just um, um, we are we are in the middle of another shock, which is the COVID nineteen, uh, and in the middle of the COVID nineteen, the war in uh, Russia and Ukraine has had a huge impact on the food systems in in the world. Uh, these two shocks they came to us un unexpectedly, uh, but it is actually a wake up call for for all of us and. 
I think uh, this is the time for us to begin this kind of a discussion which we are having today to say, what is it that we can prepare towards 2030 to ensure that at least we cushion ourselves as uh, uh, from uh, food insecurity. So uh, as, as, as my opening line, I would want to highlight that when it comes to shocks in the system, they are inevitable. They come whether we like it or not. All we need to do as cities is to prepare. And for us to prepare, we need to have some sort of a, a, a predictive um, a analysis that we always do to plan ahead, to try to detect what is likely to be uh, the problem in the system that we'll be considering. So for us uh, in the food systems, uh, I'm going to speak about four things that I think uh, we need to uh, look quite closely at uh, in the next five to 10 years. And they have the potential to disrupt our food systems, enhance access to food, uh, and also the nutrition. The first thing that I want to talk about is the impact of uh, climate change, which um, I don't want to overemphasize on this particular matter uh, because I'm quite aware that it's something that has been spoken in every corner and in every meetings that we go into, but suffice to say that uh, this particular problem is upon us and cities need to do something. Um, the unpredictable weather conditions that we see today, particularly here in Africa, where uh, even today our seasons uh, for growing food, we no longer even know when do they start and when they is actually something that, um, yeah, there's noise that is coming from the background, sorry. Um, maybe someone is not muted. Okay. So I was talking about the climate change that even uh, planning to grow food, particularly here in Africa has become very difficult in the sense that we do not even know when the rain season starts and when it ends. Sometimes it starts very early. Sometimes it starts in the middle of uh, uh, um, the months that we're not even expecting. And then this is something that we, we actually need to keep at the back of our minds that uh, the policies that we develop have got an element of the climate mitigation. And in particular, when we look at what happened here in South Africa, we had a, a problem of serious floods in one of the towns called Deben. And one of the key issues that uh, we found was that Deben as a city uh, or cities in South Africa needed to improve their disaster management strategies. We were not prepared quite enough to deal with that particular problem. Mm -hmm. And linked to climate change, again, for South Africa and possibly other cities in, in Africa, is the shortage of water. Going to 2030, it is anticipated that uh, the country in South Africa uh, will be about 17% approximately water scarce, which is quite a, a huge uh, a problem that we need to take care of now before it actually happens. And what is the problem here? Yeah. You can see that, like I indicated, that in Deben, we once had heavy rains. And some people might think that when you've got too much rains, then you are actually water secure. But then the problem is actually beyond that. For cities, I think what we need to really delve on is the issue of the infrastructure that we put in place. To what extent can it actually withhold uh, this particular uh, incidence of heavy rains? Even if we receive normal rainfall during a particular year, to what extent do we deal with the demand side of water? So we've got a population growth, uh, which is actually outpacing the capacity to store water in our cities in South Africa and possibly in other African countries. And we need to match that. As the population grows at a given percentage rate, we need to also grow our infrastructure capacity to stop the water. So this is some, some of the things that uh, we need to talk about as they relate to 
uh, the climate change that our current infrastructure is not really that sufficient or adequate enough to handle the future demand uh, going towards 2030. Another important matter that we need to take consideration of uh, in terms of the food systems or the value chain is the shortage of urban agricultural land. And this is actually something which will come to us as a shock at some point in time, given the exponential growth of the population in African cities. We've got many people living in the rural areas that are actually aspiring to be in towns in Africa, in South Africa in particular. And that on its own is actually giving pressure to the land that is available. Many farms that are surrounding us are disappearing at a fast rate. And we are saying that as cities, we need to be cognizant of that, uh, that one day uh, we wake up uh, looking at cities with tall buildings and nothing uh, as land available for growing crops. So in terms of what we need to do, I think this is the time to begin to discuss or have conversations around taking advantage of the fourth industrial revolution around urban farming and agro-processing. It's important that as cities, we start to establish innovative and smart urban agricultural technologies in order to improve uh, precision uh, farming. As you can see from the picture there, uh, something is actually being done on top of a building using what could be a recycled um, a, a tires. And this is something that we as, we as cities, we need to actually diversify our thinking into going into the future. Um, the last point that I want to highlight uh, is the shrinking or disappearance of the local food varieties. In terms of the food security itself, in Africa in particular, the local varieties are very key in the provision of nutritious and affordable food varieties. Now, with the way things are going in terms of the climate change and the urbanization that I spoke about, where the young people are coming to town and when they come to town, the perception is that you abandon what you were doing when you were living your, with your grandmother or your grandfather in the rural areas. And what it means is that when you go into shops, supermarkets, you find people actually screaming that, oh, I used to see this kind of a variety of product being grown at home. Now you used to see that. What does it mean? It means you no longer grow this kind of a thing. It comes as a shock that you see it in a supermarket. And these kind of uh, uh, varieties that are uh, indigenous to our areas are very key in the sense that they are adaptable to the environment that we are. They are resilient to shocks like drought and even floods to some extent. So as they disappear, it becomes problematic in terms of the food systems. At some point in time, uh, that heavy dependence on exogenous kind of food products will be actually problematic in so far as it requires a lot of preparation and inputs like fertilizers and etc. So these are some of the things that I think uh, we need to take consideration going into the future and to also appreciate that the food shocks are a reality. Um, they, are, they, are, they are there, it's, it's how the world is designed, but cities, we must actually learn from the past and prepare for the future. And the future is definite if we actually come together and put this kind of ideas and even add to more, um, then we should be able to have policies that are responsive to what we need to do. So in conclusion, I can say that any policy that has to do, deal with food insecurity or food security in cities must take care of one, climate change, water scarcity, the disappearance of food varieties which are indigenous to local people and a possible land shortage in future as a result of urbanization. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Tinasi. Uh, 
um, your presentation was eye-opening, interesting, and you've learned a lot. And especially when you talked about the disappearing varieties of local foods. Uh, we're facing the same uh, in Malawi as well. And it was really nice even to see other strategies that you are employing, especially, for example, like using old tires uh, to do urban agriculture. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chinashi. And we're looking forward to learning more from you in the future. Thank you. Uh, our, our next speaker is uh, from Bangladesh. And excuse me how I'm going to pronounce your name, but she's Sumaya Binche Sedlim. Uh, she is working for around five years in the research and development sectors of Bangladesh. Uh, she has done her graduation and postgraduation in environmental sciences uh, from Daha uh, University, sorry again for the pronunciation. Uh, she has experience in working in climate change adaptations, migration and environmental related projects and initiatives. In the present, she's focusing on food system, food security and the dynamics with the climate change uh, that we are facing now. Uh, over to you, uh, Sumaya. And you have 10 minutes, thank you. Maya, please. Uh, hello. 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 Uh, we can't hear you. Hello. Hello, we can hear you now. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, you're a bit shaky, though. Uh, 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 yeah, sorry. Sorry for the okay, inconvenience. Now, now we can you. Okay, now we can hear over to you. Thank you, Maya. Okay. So I would request Florence to please share my can I please share my presentation. So my, you've just gone back on mute. I'm not sure if you meant to do that. Yeah, hello. So, so I was just waiting for the good, uh, good network connection as I am outside of the office. So yes, uh, I'm good to go. So I have kept, uh, kept my, uh, my presentation very simple for now. Uh, and so uh, I, I am just sharing my presentation from Noapara municipality. So I am assisted by the mayor of uh, Noapara municipality and uh, uh, official um, official named Akram Bhai is helping me too. So I'm going with the uh, uh, title of my presentation, which is Towards the Future, Vision 2030 uh, for Tackling Food Crisis and Possible Threats. So next slide, please. <laughs> So, so I'll go first with the city interaction a bit. So Nobar is one of the major economic cities of the southern part of Bangladesh. So it has some extra attention for, for business that it is connected with rail, road, and water paths uh, uh, through the different parts of the country, as well as their border uh, very near to this, uh, this locality. So there are like chemical fertilizers, coal and process from uh, uh, factories, and stones are also imported to, to, to and distributed from Nobara. So there are like approximately 200 billion uh, data. Sumaya, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's quite hard to hear you. Could you just make sure you're really close to the microphone and just speaking very, very loudly and clearly? Because I, I, I'm struggling to hear the words, unfortunately. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, that's better. Thank you. Okay, I'm just, uh, I'm just continuing. Uh, so, Noapur is one of the like major economic cities in the southern part of Bangladesh, and uh, like uh, the, this city has some extra attention for business as it is connected through uh, railroad, um, the roads and water paths with the different uh, different areas of Bangladesh and also with India. So, there are like uh, chemical fertilizers, coal uh, plants, 
some processed crop uh, factories and stones are also imported to and from, distributed from Noapara to different areas of uh, Bangladesh. So people find it more economical and came to the came to Noapara for the uh, for uh, to to grow grow their economic condition better. Uh, the adjacent cities and the other uh, even from the bigger cities like district they came to Noapara to earn more. So around there, like Noapara covers approximately 200 billion taka per year for, for business and around three uh, lakhs people depend on this city's economic activities directly. Uh, and that's why uh, this draw attention to more people towards Noapara. So next slide, please. So uh, the food system challenge that we are focused on uh, includes few opportunity for, for the municipality as we are focusing on municipality. In Bangladesh, the administration uh, administrative system works with the sub-district level system rather to, than to work with the municipality, though it's sometimes it's better to work, work with the municipality as they are the uh, authority to develop a municipality's condition. Not, not, on, not only focusing on the sub-district level, but also the focusing on the municipality. So increased food cost for human influx in Neopara is another challenge that we are facing now. And another thing is, as it is uh, growing for economic activities, there are more industrial activities and there are more, uh, the businessmen need more land properties for growing their business. So they're like decreasing farming land as if a farmer growing a crop or uh, for example, like rice, they, uh, the money or the amount of rice they get per year, it's uh, much less than the profit they can, um, if, if he or she have rented the place for business purpose. So it's another thing. Other thing is uh, that's the reason uh, when the dependency on imported food occurred. And also, there uh, need more uh, in in Noapara. There need more involved people on specific issues related to food, as in uh, in municipality, they, there is no focal person for food system or distribution of food or other um, issues related to food. So next slide, please. So um, uh, as uh, as for today's uh, presentation, we are focusing on what food system shocks are uh, cities likely to experience as we approach to 2030. Uh, I'll go uh, what actually Noapara will face within 2030 while we are approaching for 2030. So if if uh, the industrial growth is uh, continuing like um, like it's it's in the present, there should be uh, there would be the lack of production of local food. Uh, for the uh, for lack lack of the land and for the lack of like fertility and lack of adequate food saving for any climatic hazard is another issue as as it is in the southern part of bangladesh and it's uh, it's a, a moderately climatic vulnerable to different climatic activity uh, climatic hazards and the food cost will go to higher level if this uh, the state things occur and the lower income can take balanced meal even with their present highest income, which we actually um, which we actually observed during the COVID-19 situation. When the COVID-19 situation was uh, took place and there was like lockdown, people with the lower income uh, lower income um, groups uh, suffered the suffered more than the higher income group or the other classes of people and people may move to practice for homestead or rooftop gardening for primary source of food if we face these type of problems because it's not very common in the places like noapara the homestead gardening or the rooftop gardening but it should be uh, common to mitigate the food uh, daily food consumption even even people can uh, use the vegetables or the homestead gardens uh, fruits to mitigate uh, to uh, cover their daily nutrition nutrition demand next slide please so additional uh, for additional issue as um, uh, my previous uh, uh, the previous presenter has uh, um, addressed about the covid 19 issue and the wire issue so um, noapara will also yes the these are the these are like common for the all of the areas of uh, the world all of the uh, countries or of the cities of the world but in noapara due to industrial development uh, it's it's uh, difficult it will difficult to find more people to feed and less land to cultivate. As I have addressed that, there are like higher demand of industrial land than the agricultural land. 
So another thing is the municipality can take any direct initiative as they are dependent on the sub-district level administrative authority. If the issue is still present in the future, it will be uh, like add another stress for municipality to cover up all of the issues related to food. Because uh, during the COVID-19 lockdown, they have um, they have like had some support from the government directly and they um, work for the distribution of the food and they help people, uh, they help the people directly. So they, uh, they need, they have to have some authority to work on the food security or food system issues. And that will be on the policy level um, solution to the, this type of problem. So we should also work on this. It could be the collaborative approach with the sub-district level, or it could be the direct approach to the central level of the government. So, uh, and the other thing is industrial pollution. If uh, it is not managed properly, can be a great threat to the existing environment, as well as the uh, fertility of the existing cropland. As, um, the, as the growing industries, uh, there are like, um, uh, there, are, and there are some negative impacts on the environment. And also it affects the uh, fertility of the land. And also some, the seeds are not working properly and the growth is like uh, decreasing day by day. If not, if we are not uh, using the recent uh, updated seeds, so, um, so it's 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 another case in where we need to focus on the um, green environment to have the land part, uh, land keep the land fertile properly and keeping the land uh, well to grow crop uh, uh, adequate crop. So, uh, uh, next slide, please. So there, uh, so what can sorry, cities? Sorry, cut it short. You have need to go. If you try your time, but I'm just giving you a minute to go. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I, I'm just wrapping up. So what can cities do to prepare? Prepare. So the municipality can do some awareness building program regarding food system and security, and they can support citizens to become self-sufficient in homestead gardening or rooftop gardening or using of the seeds properly. And also the protecting land for agriculture. There should be la um, individual law. There are individual law for um, agricultural land protection and they should use that properly and also supporting the urban food production uh, regulation of food, food sector with the collaboration with the uh, sub district level administration and collaboration with the uh, authority to the other ngos will be another um, solution so next slide please so uh, this is the supporting uh, sub, uh, what additional resources are required. It's supporting urban food production, practical collaboration among government and non-government that I have stated before, and the monetary help directly and seed fertilizer and necessary things for roof, rooftop and homestead gardening and training program, obviously, for the local inhabitants for homestead cultivation and building awareness, obviously. So these are all from my side as uh, I'm very sorry for for my, my time consuming in the first first uh, first step of the my, my presentation for as I'm in the field. Sorry for the inconvenience. And if you have any question, please feel free to share. No problem. Thank you, Sumaya, for, for your presentation. Um, We've learned that we have so many challenges that are common to every city. We've learned from Johannesburg. We've also learned from the Bangladesh. And you can see that the challenges are common to every city. But we've also learned that Bangladesh is uh, trying to promote rooftop gardens or homestead gardening uh, so as to tackle the food insecurity that they are facing. Uh, our next presenter uh, is Dr. Rosemary Jenkins from Birmingham. Uh, she is in a, she has a role in uh, in uh, the city of Birmingham. Her role is the and the team has involves developing the food uh, system strategy uh, by taking a read on the cook and Commonwealth campaign, aiming to encourage Birmingham citizens to come together to celebrate the city's cultural diversity through cooking food from around the world and organizing the creating a healthy food city forum workshops. She's also passionate about mitigating food insecurities in the city and is involved in working to improve people's ability to access and afford healthy food. Rosemary holds a PhD in public health from Imperial College of London, where she investigated the impacts of the UK government's austerity policies on food insecurity 
diets and healthy outcomes. So as you can see, she's well uh, knowledgeable about food insecurities and diets. Please welcome uh, Dr. Rosemary um, to tell us more about what she does. Thank you. Hi, Kathy. Thanks so much, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, I'll just share my screen. Um, can you see that? Um, hopefully you're able to see that, but just shout um, if you can't. So, um, yeah, it's great to be here um, presenting on food insecurity um, in Birmingham. So I think we've had such a good overview from the other speakers on um, the impacts and things, things and issues that cause food insecurity. Um, and um, in this in this talk, I'll be giving a sort of overview of the, the steps that we've been taking in Birmingham um, to um, mitigate that. So um, just to give you a bit of a plan for this session, I'll talk you through the context about Birmingham and the kind of definition of food insecurity that we've been using. Um, and then I'll talk you through the steps that we've been taking as a city um, through the council and through other groups to, um, to address food insecurity and help um, the most vulnerable people in our city um, to access nutritious food. Um, so uh, here is Birmingham. Um, it is where the, the red pin is. Um, it's England's second city. It has a population of 1.1 million people. And it's a really diverse city with people from all sorts of um, cultural and ethnic um, backgrounds and differences. Um, but it's also a city um, that's quite deprived. And you can see um, where the dark blue is on the map of the city. Those are um, wards that are really deprived and um, where people don't have much money. Um, and that, because of that, that maps on to a high risk of food insecurity based on demographic characteristics for quite a lot of the city, as you can see with the dark red being people at high risk of food insecurity. So just to talk you through a bit of a, the definition of food insecurity that, um, that we use, um, maybe from a developed country perspective, although I think it, to be honest, um, is relevant for, for all kinds of countries. Um, so food insecurity has a number of definitions, but it's fundamentally related to reducing quality and quantity of food due to limited resources. Um, so, for example, it's um, defined by the Food and Agriculture Organization as limited access to food due to a lack of money or other resources. And you can see from the picture that it can range from mild food insecurity, so worrying about being able to obtain food, moderate food insecurity, compromising quality and variety of food, reducing quantities, skipping meals, to severe food insecurity and um, experiencing hunger. In 2018, the UK was estimated to have the highest level of food insecurity in Europe. And um, food insecurity has been increasing in the UK since 2010. Um, and as um, the other speakers highlighted, this has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. So why is food insecurity an issue in developed countries? Um, well, it, it still leads to decreased fruit, vegetable and protein consumption, increased processed food consumption, disordered patterns of eating and lower levels of vitamins and minerals. It's also associated with poorer physical health, higher body weight and obesity, especially in adult women, and chronic disease, irrespective of knowledge of how to eat healthily. Um, but the UK only actually introduced a national measure of food insecurity in 2021, last year, which has led to issues in ascertaining the prevalence and severity of food insecurity over time. And also with this new national measure, there is little granularity to assess the food insecurity in our city. And so in the UK, food bank use has tended to be used as an imperfect proxy for food insecurity, but there are issues with this. Um, food parcels from food banks don't account for repeated use, so it's hard to tell the actual number of people who are using food banks. And generally data is only available um, for one type of food bank, which comes under the Trussell Trust, which is a large network of food banks. But you can see in the graph, that um, which shows food bank use in Birmingham, that actually the number of food parcels given out since 2015 has actually, um, sorry, 2014 to 2015, has actually doubled um, in that time. And therefore we have commissioned work as a first step um, to ascertaining food insecurity. We've commissioned work to work out the amount of food insecurity in Birmingham. Now this is currently being undertaken, but it's suggestive that um, initial results have suggested that around a quarter of people in Birmingham might be food insecure due to their, due to their income. 
Um, so our second step has been making food insecurity a priority for Birmingham. Now this has involved um, making it a priority individually. So now the Birmingham City Council food system team that I'm a member of, um, each member volunteers one day a month um, at a community or voluntary project across the city to support these organisations and also to learn from people across the city in order to influence our approach going forwards. So two weeks ago, I visited um, a food bank in the north of the city. Um, we've also made it a priority in the Birmingham Food System Strategy, and that is through a specific work stream on food security and resilience, which aims to ensure all citizens in every community at every age have access to sufficient, affordable, nutritious and safe food. But that also actions um, to reduce food insecurity are embedded across the strategy itself. Um, we've also made a priority in some international work. Um, we're currently working on a plan um, with Johannesburg around food insecurity and also through our food justice pledge. And I just wanted to give a brief spotlight on the food justice pledge. Um, so there is something, um, there is a slight difference between food insecurity and food justice with food justice having more of an emphasis on right to food. Um, but in the UK, they sort of mean a similar thing. Um, but just to say that. Um, so this pledge calls on cities across the world to collaborate with us to raise the voices of cities in national and international arenas and collaborate for us um, with us, Birmingham, for action on food justice. So I'll just read the pledge out. It says that as city mayors, we're committed to addressing food justice by acknowledging that all of our citizens irrespective of status are entitled to safe and nutritious food at all times. We recognize the benefits of a collaborative partnership to address the global challenge of food insecurity exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, climate crisis and disaster displacement. So this is a great way in which um, you could make food insecurity a priority for your city. Um, but that's not the only benefit. Um, cities that pledge, um, that sign up to the pledge, will be invited to work with us as part of a learning and sharing network to build political networks between the cities as we work together to ensure food justice for our citizens across the world. And so do email um, the food systems email address on the slide for more information. Um, we'd love to hear from you, especially if you're keen in signing that pledge. It'll be great to have lots of the food cities, cities signing that pledge. Um, so back to the steps. Um, so the third step has been assessing services, helping people in need, um, ensuring that when people are food insecure, they're able to access food. So the Food Justice Network is a network of food banks, affordable food models and other organisations helping people access and afford food. And um, we've helped them map, these, map and validate these organisations that are helping um, to help people afford food in this area so that we um, know what's going on and we're able to start considering what we might be able to do to help. We're also working on making this map accessible when people need it. And we've also been raising awareness of food aid options for professionals in contact with the public. So, for example, we've made food parcels, food parcels available to be delivered by social care workers and um, through three social care hubs for them to use. So the fourth step has been helping improve the experience of people who are food insecure. Now, this is a bit of a moving feast, um, but here are some things that we've been up to so far. So firstly, um, evidence suggests that shame and stigma um, are important in preventing people from accessing the help that they need um, because they're too ashamed to do so. And so something I've been doing is reviewing what causes this shame and stigma in using food banks and how we can prevent um, that going forward so people do get the help that they need. We've also been looking at different models with the potential to help people afford food. So in the UK, there are food banks which offer a free food parcel for people who are going through real acute crises, who aren't able to afford food, have nothing in the cupboards. But we're looking at what if there's a sort of middle ground there in models that help people afford food, but give them a bit of choice, help them um, with the dignity of paying for some food, but giving them more affordable prices um, rather than shopping at supermarkets, so a kind of middle ground there. We're also looking at greater signposting and connectivity between different um, uh, things that help people who are food insecure and kind of bringing them together in different services. And we're also looking into how food banks and community cafes run to help that be um, smoother and see what needs to be done there. And I've had the privilege this week of reading some accounts from some students who undertook participant observation in a community cafe um, in Birmingham. And so finally, um, we don't want to just help people improve 
Um, we don't want to help improve the experience of people who have food insecurity. We also want to prevent it in the first place. And there are a number of ways in the strategy um, which are described in the strategy to help prevent food insecurity. And that includes affordable food models, as I mentioned before, um, increasing awareness and uptake of prevention initiatives, um, supporting knowledge and skills that are needed to prevent food insecurity, increasing the healthy, affordable food options um, available in our city, working um, towards being a living wage city where people are paid an amount that they can live off um, through the work that they do, and influencing welfare and employment practices. So that's been um, a whistle-stop tour of the different things that we've been doing in Birmingham to help prevent food insecurity. I thought just in the final 30 seconds, um, this is related to food insecurity, but I draw your attention to um, our Cook the Commonwealth project, which we've we're launching on social media today, um, which has collected recipes from um, all 72 countries in the Commonwealth. And I've already noticed that there are quite a few of representatives from this country in this call today, South Africa, Bangladesh, I think the Indian cities are here as well, and Malawi, um, and I'll put the link in the chat um, after I finish talking and sharing my screen, but just to say that um, there are these recipes from your countries and it would be great to see if you could have a look at them and see if they're representative um, and get excited about that as we get excited about cooking your food. So um, thanks very much and um, back, to, back to the main session. Thank you, Dr. Rosemary. Um, thank you very much. You've learned a lot how you're helping the people who are facing food insecurity and also how you not only helping, but also you how you're trying to prevent food insecurity around the world. And also what is interesting is the cook the common with. I can't wait to see what the recipe for Malawi is. Uh, and also I'm interested in the um, the praise that the mayors has taken. And I'm happy because the city mayor of Mzuhu City joined us for the first time and is just being introduced to the uh, the praise that has been made uh, at the Benyak City. Well done, Karen. Thank you. Uh, and now let me open the floor to question and answers if anyone has a question or um, someone wants to comment. Uh, it's time for that now. Please come forward. Anyone with a comment? Uh, Uh, if there is no one with a comment, then I will have to hand over to uh, Florence to take over. And thank you very much for the opportunity that you've given us. And thank you, everyone who presented today. You've learned a I'm lot about the challenge. I'm actually uh, just going to ask a question, Kathy, and then hand over to you and try and encourage other people to um, to to, to um, join the conversation um, and to put some questions to to our speakers as well. Um, uh, this question was for Sumaya, if she is still with us. Um, or has she, she might have dropped off because she's working in the field. <laughs> okay, well, in fact, maybe I can ask a question to the group then if Samaya is no longer I'm with here. us. I'm here. Oh, sorry, she... I'm here. Great, great, great. Um, I was interested as um, to ask you, um, you talked about how in Bangladesh um, you have a situation where the local municipalities um, and the local governments don't have that much autonomy or that much independence to, um, to implement and create policy on a local level. Um, and they have to work with the sub-district um, and higher levels of government. Um, how does that how does that relationship work? Is there ways that the local governments can 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 lobby and can try and influence um, those higher levels of government um, to inform inform policy? Uh, yes, it it's uh, work like this, uh, and also it's like uh, the municipality is the uh, is another unit that is focused only on the city level, uh, city based uh, area. And the sub-district level works for the city level area as well as the adjacent village area or the rural uh, rural area. So there are like uh, some segregation, segregation of initiative or work that we need, which will focus on the municipality or city-based area rather than to uh, work in the both areas. Like in most of the cases, the sub-district level take the decision which is good for all of the areas, including the rural and also the peri-urban or urban. 
but uh, sometimes you need to fo- if, if you need to focus on the municipality so you need to focus on the more urban inclusive uh, initiatives rather than to focus on the rural as um, the uh, i have i have gone through the demerits and the other issues that are related with the industrial development and the economic activities of the noapara so there are some uh, works that the uh, sub district level administration can work for the for this uh, for example the the land right the land right for the agriculture land is a basic for uh, the overall sub district but when it comes to the municipality uh, there is sometimes the law is not uh, sometimes the law is accepted and sometimes the law is not properly uh, properly included and uh, maintained so in this type of uh, issues we need to focus on the municipality rather than to focus on the all over sub district so that's where i focused that it needs some uh, platform or collaboration to uh, between the municipality and the sub district to work for the betterment of the municipality not only for the sub district level because there are some issues that the municipality mayor is a elected uh, person who works for the people where the sub district level you will get the higher authority which is the administrative uh, body from the central government so also there are some issues regarding the politics and the administration so it's it's a very vast place to work on actually so but but the but the collaboration yes some ngos or some research organization or the or even we can uh, actually request them to sit together and uh, talk and have some policy uh, which can uh, be uh, good for both of them so and 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 in some cases municipality sometimes com- complain that even for the waste management or the other issues they don't always get the uh, expected services or expected uh, friendliness to their work from the administrative uh, sector right that's really interesting to hear sort of yeah using that those those collaborative relationships to to kind of create that that call um and that pressure um and i'd be really interested to hear if any other um cities have similar experiences about how they work to influence policy at um higher national levels so if anyone else um would like to contribute or like to um to to make a comment on on that sort of working relationship that'd be really interesting I can see that Rosie has her hand up as well. Yeah, hi. Um I I had a question also. Um I think I think both of the other presenters talked about um climate change as being a really important issue in in food insecurity for your cities and um I'm I'm really interested to hear when climate change feels like such a global um kind of issue how actually as maybe for both the presenters and also if there are other cities here who are tackling this issue how actually at a city level you can prevent the impacts of that and kind of work work on that issue because to me it feels so so massive i'm really interested to hear how how cities are kind of working on that at a at a regional and at a city level if anyone um has any comments on that maybe from the presenters or um any other cities Hello. Hello. Not we can hear you. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, of course. I just want also to give an example, maybe of Malawi. Like cities here in Malawi, I think we have been decentralized. So we have been given that chance that other policies, like maybe by roads and other things, I think we can make them on our own, like or at the city level. and if that really works if in the terms of enforcement that works but of course there are other things of course we work with the central government but most of the things i think have been just decentralized to the cities so cities can do things on their own of course this of course is different maybe from our friends in bangladesh so as malawi i think we don't have a problem on that yeah so that's what i wanted just to speak on malawi thank you Thank you Atam. Uh anyone else please? Uh 
I wonder if um, if Dr. Mosheni Yama is, is still with us, whether you uh, might be able to um, comment on um, Rosie's question around um, climate change mitigation. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yeah, um, I, 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 my apologies, I joined a bit uh, later. I connected a bit later, but um, my name is Mary Ann Kahitu from Namibia. Ventuk, Namibia. Great, welcome, lovely to have you. Thank you, I also just want to share our experience. Um, not that much, but uh, we um, in Ventuk at city level, we um, developed um, what we refer to as a Ventuk climate change. In fact, a Ventuk integrated climate change strategy. So uh, we also um, uh, uh, took from national experience and uh, we came up with that strategy to guide us on, on, on how we should uh, uh, also make our contribution to climate change at, at city level. So um, it, it, in that strategy, uh, we have a number of theme areas or focus areas. For instance, to link to this uh, uh, subject of food cities, there, will, there is an area talking to food security as a focus area of that strategy. Then there are other areas like uh, water security, uh, healthy cities, and other areas. So um, we, we look at fo uh, food security under that strategy, as, a, as, as, as uh, Rosemary has indicated that it is massive. For her, it seems very massive and so forth. For us, I think it's the same. We are also just learning about climate change, but we have learned, uh, uh, we have learned that, uh, in fact, to address climate change, you address other issues, and then they assist you to become resilient, so that then when uh, maybe the impact of, of climate change hit your city or wherever you are, at least then you have, if you have achieved water security, food security, and some of the other, you have addressed some of the other challenges, then also to some extent you have achieved some uh, res resilience. And in that you have also perhaps adopted some uh, uh, mitigation measures, adaptation measures, and so forth. We have uh, uh, a colleague of mine who, is our, our, our expert in climate change. So we, we have a desk uh, that we have established here at local level. We call it the climate change desk. And we uh, collaborate with um, Bremen, it's a, it's a city in Germany. So we have a partnership and Germany also assists us with uh, technical, they, they provide uh, to us technical support. And through that technical support also we are about to consider a technical expert that we will that we will uh, uh, perhaps get that we will get through the through that the, that support and through that partnership and the, the the it will be a contract of two years the 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 the, the, the expert will be expected to come and just ensure that we we build capacity to implement our strategy and also to set up our program on climate change and then after two years when the expert leave the expert should have uh, uh, build capacity locally. So I think uh, I just thought also to share that experience. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. That was really, really interesting. Um, and really interesting to hear about calling on um, using external expertise, which is something that has come up a number of times in these webinars about um, working with partners and, and having that um, external um, expertise coming in to sort of inform strategies for, you know, such a huge and complex subject. Um, so that, that makes a, an awful lot of sense to, to be employing um, experts for different areas and different challenges across the food system. Um, I just wanted to, um, before I hand back to Kathy, just to wrap up, I just wanted to ask um, Balance if she would um, care to, to contribute because, um, She's just joining us from Durban. Um, obviously, Durban have been facing some really awful floods lately, um, and that's one area that um, 
I know that they're, they're having to um, to deal with in Durban around um, influences of climate change. Um, and I wondered if there was anything else in terms of the strategy in um, Durban um, for climate, climate change mitigation and preparing for the effects of climate change um, that you could share with us at all balance if, if you're there and you're happy to do so. Uh, thank you, Florence. Hi, everyone. I got disconnected there, I think, for about uh, 10 minutes, and I missed, I think I missed most of the things, and I was, uh, I'd be really interested to hear about the climate strategy that was just discussed now, but um, I guess I'll catch up on the recording. So with what recently happened, it's been really devastating. So if you remember, we are assisting 500 community gardens and 66 of them have been like really badly affected infrastructure, um, losing their seeds and seedlings, everything that they had so it's literally like washed off. So that's been really bad. But with the current strategy that we are developing, we're working together with our climate protection unit department that is assisting with developing a climate smart agriculture, um, I mean, a, a climate smart food policy. So me really looking forward to that and also from learning um, from other countries on how they are going to be implementing a climate smart uh, food strategy. Thanks. Thank you, Balance. And um, thank you very much for contributing. Oh, we've got one more hand up. So um We've got time for just one more quick comment and then we'll have to wrap up. Please do, um, do go ahead, 16308. <laughs> Good morning once more, colleagues from across the globe who are connected to this call. Uh, my name is James Kalundu. I'm a colleague of uh, Madame Gahitu who has just spoken from Wind. Uh, I wanted to just also agree with her in terms of how we've modified our approach to the issue of food and nutrition vis-a-vis -vis the climate change challenge. Uh, at the micro level, we have gone to the extent or the extreme of going into creating community gardens uh, on the premise or rather the understanding or the principle that and I have to do it in, in, in very close consultation or observation of what the climate change dictates by improving on the plowing methods. I've, I've been very delighted to see what our brother in Jobek is doing by using smaller space to produce more through the tire utilization. And also, uh, we've been, because of water scarcity, been at the garden level, been educating the public, of course, through work and practice, that uh, we can still grow crops. The permaculture method, which has proven to be very water, a good method of plowing, meaning you, you plow the nature and, and well that you reduce the usage of pesticides all the other chemicals. Of course, being a desert, we can't do it with ammonia and, and all those uh, uh, chemicals that, that would be needed. But we are very cognizant of being a desert country and also making sure that we do grow crops in, in close observation of what the climate dictates, because we do have quite a rate of evaporation. The areas in some, in some instances are very rocky. But it's, it's now up to us to either use black or bags to plow. Uh, the permaculture is proven to be the best method of not distracting the environment and also making sure that you produce, uh, not damaging the environment where you are. Then I wanted to move to the question that my doctor from Kingham Council City raised on the food banks. Uh, how have they gone to? Uh, monitor and regulate the multi, multiple beneficiation of residents. Uh, is there a way to monitor that uh, households or individuals are not uh, benefiting in multiple times to allow the good coverage of uh, the food parcels? Thank you. 
sorry, thank you so much for that contribution. I, you just broke up at the very end there with that last question. Would you mind just repeating it, please? The last bit was about the, the, the observation I made that Birmingham has quite a number of banks. Only food banks produce those food parcels. In, in some experiences, you will find that when the food banks are there, there will be that multiple benefication by the public benefiting from the center and then benefiting again from the other center, thereby making the targeted group a bit weak in terms of not some food might end up with only a few, but then there must be a way to monitor that if you are if in the Birmingham city and you, you go to another part of the city, you don't benefit multiple times. Thank you. I think that's a question for me. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not entirely sure that I understand the question, but I think it's relating to um, food banks in certain areas. And I think um, basically what we've found is that there's, there's such a high level of need at the moment. I also don't know if other countries are experiencing this or have heard about this, but we're also having um, what's called a kind of cost of living crisis in um, the UK at the moment where prices of fuel and food um, and bills are increasing a lot. Um, and so many, many people are finding themselves um, finding it difficult to afford food. And I think um, there just seems to be a lot of need for kind of food banks, but also these kind of affordable food models and, and different ways in which um, people might need to access um, access food. Um, I wasn't entirely sure of, um, entirely, as I said, entirely sure of the question, but I think um, what we're finding is actually like there's, there's the need for that kind of connecting up local services. So if someone goes to, for example, a Trussell Trust food bank, you can only use it three times in six months and you have to be transferred, um, um, transferred word, um, referred um, to it. And so, um, and so the kind of idea that that food bank might be able to signpost people to a food club, for example, where they might be able to um, purchase food, but much cheaper and kind of having that, um, just having a more connected system um, of those kind of things that are helping people be able to afford food. Um, I'm not sure if that has answered your question, but um, sort of ruminated on food banks for a bit. <laughs> uh, Florence? Yes. Uh, yes, can I can I add to to the discussion? Uh, just try to answer the question that was raised by the previous speaker. Just to add to the Birmingham. Of course, please. Okay. Uh, morning, once again, colleagues. Uh, uh, it's Tinashe from the city of Johannesburg. Um, just to to respond to to the colleague, I can't remember. Was it from Venduk? Uh, I can't remember, but. The question was, how do we deal with um, double dipping? So, for example, the city of Johannesburg goes to a community and distribute food parcels. And when we come back tomorrow, a, another sphere of government, a, maybe the province, a, as an example, goes to the same community and distribute the the, the food parcels and at the end of the day, you, you find that a household, one household has got, a, has benefited two, twice or thrice uh, from different spheres of government. Uh, that's, that's my understanding of the question that how do we deal with that? Uh, so that at least a person does not take advantage of, of, of the system. It has happened in the city of Johannesburg, uh, especially it was quite evident uh, when COVID was officially declared in 2020, uh, at the beginning of 2020. So everyone was rushing private sector, the organizations, uh, NGOs, sorry, uh, us as municipality, the province, and even the national government. Uh, we're running around to the communities with food parcels. And then after a month or so, we realized that many people did not receive even a single parcel of food. 
and there were many other households that had received more than 10 times, you know, to the extent that it was possible to even make business through that. So what, what, what we are trying to do in the city of Johannesburg is, it speaks to the issue of uh, um, the, the use of uh, data to target your beneficiaries. So what we're trying to do is, as a city, we, we have developed a database of what we call the expanded social package database where uh, everyone in the city of Johannesburg who earns a certain uh, income, uh, we kept it at, in rand about uh, not more than 2000, I think, it must be registered in that database. And then we clean it up and make sure that uh, it's quite representative. And that database is the one that we try to engage with the partners. So we identify another, uh, we have got another database of partners that we have uh, that are pro protagonists in uh, food distribution in the city of Johannesburg. And then regularly we meet and discuss the food distribution challenges. And there we engage and sell the idea that let's use a central database. The question is, they always ask who should develop it because there are costs associated with it. And that's where the city must actually lead that process because everything that happens in our space is actually feathering our vision. So we then take lead in that process that we become the custodian of that database, we grow it, we with of course engaging with our partners, clean it, and then everyone in the city of Johannesburg who is interested in uh, the space of food distribution uh, actually comes via us. So it's more like selling this concept of this database of people or households in the city of Johannesburg in such a way that it improves accountability even for partners so that they don't just go with their funders money without any sort of level of accountability. So we are selling that kind of a, a thing to them that if you come via us, then you can trace and track who are you targeting and who has benefited and by when. And then we are hoping because this is something that is actually featuring in the policy review. So we are hoping that we'll begin to eliminate the double dipping and duplications of the beneficiaries going forward. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Florence. Thank you very much. That was really, uh, really interesting, um, really helpful. Um, it's great to hear some discussion. Um, Kathy, I hand, hand back to you as our chair. Would you like to wrap up the session? And um, I just as well um, just remind everyone that we've got our next session uh, in two weeks from now. So we look forward to seeing you all again. And uh, thanks from me. And I'll um, uh, hand back to Kathy to, to finish us up. Thank you. Well, thank you, Florence. Uh, let me thank all the speakers that were here today. Uh, Dr. Tinashe, Sumaya, and Dr. Rosemary, thank you. It was a wonderful contribution. And also, for those that commented and those that were present, we thank you very much. And just to uh, appreciate our food cities, our food foundation, uh, this platform is really important whereby you've managed to put different cities with different problems, different strategies together so we can put our heads together and find out how we can solve this issue of food insecurity. We really appreciate that. And, and we look forward to have a more solid platform like yeah, we can share on a daily basis, like maybe a WhatsApp group, I don't know, but if we can have something that can actually keep us all from different cities in contact on a daily basis or any time we want to talk to each other, I think that would be of much help. Uh, thank you very much, Florence, and thank you everyone who attended today. Great, and um, thank you, Kathy, as well, for your excellent sharing. Bye then, everyone. See you again in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.